welcome everybody that's on already and I know we will be joined by others. I am completely prepared. I am ready. Oh, you and are ready. I'm, what are you drinking? I'm drinking Chardonnay and uh, in, in uh, my hand painted uh, wine glass. So that's my uh, evil of choice. Uh, I was lucky enough to be in a a very good uh, wine group about 20 years ago, and it um, it spoiled me for rotten wine. I, I ended up getting a taste for really expensive stuff I couldn't afford, but I know there's uh, there's good stuff out there, and you're going to tell us about it. But I want to make sure that I thank uh, Peter Dills, who um, uh, is was actually born into the world of of food and wine. His dad was a, a a food and, and restaurant critic for many years. So poor little Peter got dragged around to all these fabulous places. Um, and then uh, went out on his own. dragged around, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he now is uh, on Go Country 105 as a radio host talking food and wine and showcasing some of our best restaurants in Southern California. Um, and he was kind enough to, to bring uh, Michael Higgins, who, I mean, I hope you go to his website and read all about him, because if I kept telling you all the cool things about him, we'd use up the whole hour. Uh, but I loved this line that uh, he has not only been the publisher of Flying Adventures magazine, but it's a lifestyle travel publication for food and wine lovers who own and travel on their own private airplanes. Jesus, Michael, that's a rarefied lifestyle that you live. Uh, we can only hope to uh, learn about it. Anyway, uh, you have tasted the finest wine and food the world over, and I hope you'll share some of that with us today. And um, cheers. 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 So we, do we, uh, oh, you, I, look at Yes, I'm pouring right now. I'm pouring right now. Should we pour at the now. same time? All right. And cheers with her. Cheers okay, cheers. let's do it. Yeah. So, Michael, I brought a cake bread, cake bread cellars. They uh, rain out of uh, Rutherford area of the North Napa Valley. Valley. Napa Valley. It's yeah. Rutherford. And all of their wines, the Sauvignon Blancs, the Pinots, the Chardonnays, and I'm missing one. Probably Sauvignon Blanc. Cabernet also. Sauvignon Blanc. They're all from Rutherford. So they're, they're not sourcing any of the grapes from, let's say, the Central Coast. It's all from Rutherford, and that's what makes cake bread uh pretty special because it was the the inside of it was i told pat that i was bringing cake bread to the party and she <laughs> said oh isn't that kind of vile isn't that kind of cheap and i said cupcake Cups she goes oh yeah cup, cup, <laughs> okay <laughs> yes yeah so now <laughs> we're gonna have a little cake bread and we do have other people here in the studio and we brought enough to share with everybody okay all right so we've got a, a conversation that we're going to have with Michael today about his books that he has written. So obviously he's gone all over the world. And I was a little worried because we had a little time for prep, but I thought he might forget about California. But Mike's got some real good news, great news for all of us, because after uh, this book is published, the Exploring Wine Regions, the Bordeaux, you are? Doing California. All right. So here's to California. Yes. And here's to all the people Cheers. that are watching on Zoom Cheers. and on Facebook. I'm not going to get technical. Does it matter about the glass? Is there an official Chardonnay glass? So even with red wine and Chardonnay, I can still swirl around just like you would? You, you definitely want to swirl. And the reason you swirl is it brings the aromas out. Because remember, the taste in your mouth has a lot to do with what you smell, with your nose. If, if I say something that is incorrect to all the hundreds of thousands of people that are watching, you can correct me because I have no pride here or shame. So there's nothing wrong with drinking a bottle of wine incorrectly. Okay. It still so, tastes good. So my thought is we only, uh, we only put this Chardonnay on ice for about 10 minutes, but I think that way we get to be able to taste it because a lot of times people they'll buy an $8 wine, a Chardonnay especially, or a hundred dollar wine, and they almost freeze it, thus losing all the flavor at all. You're right. The more you chill it, the less you're going to uh, experience in the flavors. So with this Chardonnay from Rutherford, do you think I chilled, we, did, we, did we chill it enough? It's, it's, I like it. Okay, cheers. I like then. it, cheers. Yes, it's chilled okay, just I passed, enough. I passed the first test on the uh, 
the Chardonnay, bringing it to the expert. Michael Higgins is a wine author and a doctor. And what else? What else? Impress us with all your uh, uh, diplomas. My diplomas. Wow. Um, gosh, I, I'm, I'm in the publishing business. I was introduced with Flying Adventures. I'm a pilot. I fly airplanes. I produce magazines for people who travel on planes. But the book series is called Exploring Wine Regions. Right. This is the book right here. Okay. So Exploring Wine Regions is a book series. This one's on Bordeaux, France, and it officially releases in eight days. October 15th is the official release date. And I love doing this because okay. I go to Bordeaux. So Exploring Wine Regions is about exploring them. So for three years, I went twice a year for three years. I actually spent 21 weeks in Bordeaux, photographing, meeting the winemakers, eating the food, staying in the castles. If there's one thing I told you about Bordeaux that just is mesmerizing is the castles. This is the land of castles. There are castles everywhere. And I have lots of pictures of castles in here. Well, we like pictures. What is, yes. a, what is a Bordeaux style of wine? A Bordeaux style. I want to show you one of my favorite castles. So we live in California. California is considered new world winemaking. Okay. And France is considered old world. So when we buy wine in, in, in California, we think of buying a Pinot Noir, a Cabernet, a Merlot, a Chardonnay. That is not how the French do it. No. No. The French grow the grapes on their property and they make the wine from the grape on their property and it's a blend so they're like chefs they really make one wine so when you think of going to a winery and they may have five or ten different wines that's not how it is there they're perfecting the best of their property and they're blending different grapes to make the very best they have okay so if i go to the region of france a uh, region of re region of champagne in france and they are producing champagne and using a Chardonnay type of grape or a Pinot, uh, a, a Pinot, Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir yeah. type of grape. They're not going to sell, they're not going to produce any Chardonnays or any Pinot Noirs. It's going to exclusively be champagnes. Right. See, the way the regions work is in Champagne, they're only allowed to grow that Chardonnay and that Pinot Noir and use that in their their sparkling wine, which they call champagne. What's to stop them from selling it to somebody else, the grapes? You know, some guy comes up in a truck and says, hey, I want a, a bushel of grapes. I'm going to make my own Chardonnay. Well, they can do that, but they can't call it, um, they, they can't call it, call it by the region. So they okay. can't call it champagne. Right, right. Or like in Bor and and, and if Even the grapes are from the region of That's champagne. right. Okay. That's right. Okay. So in Bordeaux, there's five red grapes, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Malbec, which you brought a Malbec yeah, from, yes. from uh, Argentina, yeah. and uh, Petit Verdot and Cabernet Franc. Those are the five Bordeaux varietals. Okay. That's what grows them. You are prohibited from growing those in Champagne, just like you're prohibited from growing that Chardonnay in Bordeaux. So they have wine laws in California about a state grown in years. I won't get into that. That's but it's a, a whole too... different set of rules. We have different, we have a lot of rules here right. and they have a lot of rules there, but the rules are different. Okay. Is, does the, do these rules equate to a, a level playing field for the producers and for those people that are trying to sell and make money? It is a level playing field. I mean, okay. they all play by the same set of rules and they know what they are. Okay. So, so I don't. For some reason, I'm going to stick to France, south of France. Okay. You have the Rhone, Rhone area, right? Yes. And then you've got places where they're big on rosés right now. Mm -hmm. um, and what else are they, are, they, are they producing down there? So, when you speak of Rhone, the Rhone yeah. Valley, that right. would be like a Syrah that comes from the Rhone Valley. Uh -huh. So, when so you speak of a rosé. Yeah. You could make the rosé in any of those regions uh -huh. because the rosé is going to be the grape, say the Syrah, uh -huh. that they leave the skins on for a very short period of time so it has a, just a little bit of color. Okay. But you could do the same thing with Cabernet in Bordeaux and call it a rosé there. And they do that. Well, you know, since we're talking 
you know, wine and the, you know, God made uh, uh, water, for, uh, wine from water transformed or whatever the story is. And we want to talk about waters and clean waters. Uh, do different, does that have an effect? California water, waters in Spain, France, uh, how, how, is, how does that come about? Well, water does make the difference. I mean, think think of we're switching subjects, but think about Coors. Don't they say it's the water? And there's a, a pizza company in New York that actually uh, exports their water to California, and then some of these pizza places here in California say we only use New York, New York wine. I don't know if that matters once it's boiled out, but it makes it for a good story. Yeah, but if you're taking spring water, well water, I mean, this is, you know, there's particular min min minerals in there that the plants are drinking. Because think of the soil, the soil has minerals in it too. And, right. and the roots are absorbing this and it's what's part of making the flavor. Like you brought, is this the uh, Malbec? Yes. Yeah. So a Malbec in Argentina is completely different than the Malbec in Bordeaux. Okay. And it's, it's because of the terroir, it's the land, right. it's the water. Because okay. in Bordeaux, there's two major rivers. In uh, Argentina, it's the Andes Mountains, so it's snow melt. So it's two different sources of water, different land, different temperatures. It's a whole different environment and it produces a very different wine. Is Malbec a style of wine or is it again like champagne? It has to be from a region. You answered it. But... It's, it's actually neither. It's a grape. Okay. Malbec is a grape and the grape comes from Bordeaux. Okay. And Original. Originally. All right. So would we have anything in California that would be similar that we're growing here. Maybe a Pinot, Pinot Noir, uh, Grenache. What? Anything similar, or is it? It's got to be a Malbec that is imported. Well, a Malbec is a Malbec. A Pinot Noir is a Pinot Noir. They're two very different grapes, and they have two very different flavors. In California, I think we produce over a hundred thousand acres. I'm going to get technical. Sorry. Um, we produce over 100,000 acres of the Chardonnay grape, okay? I can believe that. Yeah. And then and as far as Pinots, Pinots are a little tougher. Pinot Noir, I'm sorry, there's Pinot Grigio and Pinot Grigio. Pinot Noirs are a little tougher uh, to, to farm than the Chardonnay. Chardonnays grow pretty easily. But um, are there some grapes or, or some grapes that just can't um, assimilate to California? And I'm going to get on to Temecula and Paso Robles and Napa after you answer that question. Well, you, you ask a, actually a bigger, more fascinating question. One of the things that's exciting about California is that we have a lot of different places to grow grapes that have different terroir. Okay. So in the really hot regions like this Rutherford, you know, where Chardonnay and Cabernet work really, really well. So when it comes to the Pinot Noir, it wants cold. It wants like the Russian River right. or Carneros. These yes. are places that have very cold weather yeah. and they thrive in that cold weather. Okay. And so one of the nice things about California is we can really get everything we want because there's some place in California that will grow the grape optimally. In France, it's a different story. You know, if you want Pinot Noir, you're going to get that from Burgundy. And Burgundy has that cold weather. And that's where they grow it. And, that, and, and, and plus the laws say that's where it's grown too. You cannot grow the Pinot Noir in uh, Bordeaux, for example. Bordeaux is much warmer. It's, it's made for Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. And when you think of the world, you know, that loves Cabernet and Merlot, I mean, Napa's filled with Cabernet. The center of the universe, one, when you really think about it, is Bordeaux, because this is where these plants started. Cabernet started in Bordeaux, and then those plants have been brought to Napa Valley, they've been brought to Chile and to Australia, and they've been taken all over the world. I mean, Cabernet is, is, is probably the most loved grape. And so that's, this is its origin. So, I mean, going to Bordeaux, which is part of what this book is all about, is going there and experiencing where this all started. I mean, this is this is where it started. Do you have do you give little history lessons in all your books? There is a history in there. You bet there is. Yeah. Hey, I think we should reintroduce ourselves just in case people are just don't know who we are. No, they, maybe they're just 
getting on Zoom right now. You're Michael and I'm Peter. Michael and Peter. <laughs> right. My brother's name is Michael. Okay. Well, you you can be, be you're Michael. You're a brother from another. So anyway, it's Michael Higgins. It's Peter Dills. Uh, Michael is an author, a, a doctor. I'm a radio host, but we do uh, often, not just time to time, interview people like Michael that have written great books. And this book is coming out, Exploring Wine Regions, Bordeaux. Give us, a, I know you did it, give us a quick rundown of books that you've published before. And are they all exploring wine regions? Every one of them is exploring wine regions. If, if, if people want to go to our website, exploringwineregions.com, that's how you'll find us. Or even on social media, Instagram is exploring wine regions, Facebook is exploring wine regions. So they're all called exploring wine regions. And then it's the location. Okay. So like Argentina. Right. So the last book was on Argentina, which Pour some all back. Yes, we're we're talking it. Argentina. Tell me, let's, this one's on Bordeaux. And this, by the way, is 494 pages and has almost a thousand of my photographs in it. And for those of you who want to see, beautiful photos. I, for me, the best part about this book is the beautiful photography. And it's not just wineries. It's places to stay castles. in vineyards, castles. Hey, here, here's a castle, for example. I don't know if I can bring this right on up so you can see this castle. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so I point out the places where you can actually stay in the castle in the vineyard. How do you find, Amazing. How do you find out about these places? I mean, how do you book a tour? How do you book a castle? How do you know what wineries you want to visit? I mean, you know, but because of years of experience, but I think for anybody that says, wow, that looks pretty good. I think I want to go down to Argentina. I think I want to go to the Bordeaux, Bordeaux area. That's why I do these books. Right. Because before I went, I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, you can look on the internet and you can see things, but it's not the same as when you go there. And when I go there, I went for a minimum of two weeks every time. And even a, a month, at a time and one time I even went for two months at a time that's how much time I spent when I was there and I'm working with the associations the winery association the tourism associations and I'm having them lead me to the right places because a lot of people think of France and Bordeaux as the wineries are closed and it used to be that way they, they would say to you we make wine leave us alone right but they realize, partly because of California and tourism and wineries, that it makes sense for them to open up the wineries. So every winery in this book accepts tourism. And I even want to step further. It's not just tourism where you can go in and taste their wine, but they actually have things to do, you know, like going horseback riding. You know, another one has, you can get up in a tree and do wine tasting way up in the sky. And another one Blue. actually has an airplane and they'll take you for a flight over the vineyards. Oh, I mean, there's a lot of things that they're doing, the a lot of culinary. So a lot of food and wine pairings, cooking classes. They're, they're doing a lot of interesting things and that's what I seek out for this book. Right. Yeah. Well, I'd like to uh, hit you right one of these times. Let's go. <laughs> I'm ready. Yes. Good. It sounds better than Disneyland. It sounds like an adult Disneyland. It really is an adult you know? Disneyland. Yes. And speaking of adult Disneyland, I go beyond just the wineries. The Atlantic Ocean is there. So I do the whole beach community of the Atlantic Ocean. It's called the Medoc Atlantic. And then there, the city of Bordeaux is a, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's, it's, it's one of the most spectacular cities it's amazing. And then another city is saint million And that's also a UNESCO site. I have this picture here that just, when you see this, you're going to want to go to, look at that. This is downtown Bordeaux in the city center. Look at this. Does that try to get the reflection off of it? Amazing. So that's basic. Yeah, I, I get it. And so... I go into the cities and I find the places that you can do food and wine pairings because this is about, of course, exploring the wine regions. Right. And so food and wine pairings in the city, as well as going out into the vineyards and experiencing amazing restaurants, wineries, accommodations. I've got a thought. 
Yes. I have a question for you, but I first want to ask the ladies, has anybody posed any questions? Are we taking any questions? Do we have any questions? Not yet. Does no? everyone oh. want to show what they're drinking? Do, do, does what? Oh, does do anyone we... want to show what they're drinking? Oh, okay. Oh, the, the people that are watching. Or we saw what Pat's oh, yeah, drinking. Boom. You know what we're drinking? We're drinking. Uh, okay, look, look at that. How fun. Is that wow. on there? Can you see it? That's what we're drinking. Yeah. We got a couple Napa thumbs Valley up. here and Argentina here. Yeah, we got a couple of thumbs up. People uh, approve of our selections or my selections, yes. your selections. <laughs> okay, so my next question is uh, my next thought is that you've uh, obviously explored wine regions. Yes. What I, the only thing I have to go by is California because mm -hmm. I have to admit that I have not explored any other even states besides California. Well, then you do have to go with me to Bordeaux. So you will be a changed man. Would I, well, I need to be. <laughs> I noticed, Michael, that when I go to uh, going 20, 25 years, and I'm sure a lot of our watchers have gone to Paso Robles and Napa, years ago, they would invite you in and there was a sampling and tasting. And then they, as things progressed during the, in these wine regions, there became what a fee, a fee. Now they wouldn't just give you a glass, they would charge you for samples. Mm -hmm. And then they've created, they've gone even farther in selling wine and wine clubs, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, we're all right. familiar. We're all familiar with wine clubs. I bet a lot of you people are members of wine clubs. But the wine clubs sometimes, not now, but are, you could go to a supermarket, bonds or pavilions, and buy the wine cheaper than you could at the winery. So I pose back to you, is that the same case uh, in Argentina and France? Are they selling, you go, you go to the winery and then you could go five miles away and they have a little market and you can buy a bottle of wine there. How, how is the pricing? Well, the concept goes beyond wine. Okay. And that is that the manufacturers do not want to compete with their retailers. So the wineries are the manufacturers and they sell at the retail price, suggested retail. Sure. Because it, of course they could sell at the lowest price to the right. source. And if they right. did that, the retailers would be very upset. Right. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's any kind of a product. It doesn't have to be wine. It could be a refrigerator. Yeah. Manufacturers are smart not to compete with the retailers. Okay. It's suggested retail. All right. Well, then, and it's the same in, in Bordeaux. It's the same okay. in Argentina and California. It's, it's, it's more of a commerce concept. Right. Don't compete with the people who sell your product. Right. Okay, then that makes sense. That makes me actually feel a whole lot better because I was always like, why, why am I here at uh, Tramsburg and paying $39 for a Blanc de Noir when I know that I can get it somewhere for 32 easily? Mm -hmm. But okay, <laughs> I think I'm good with that answer. I, I, I feel mean, a happens. lot better about it now. But have you have you had that response from your friends in the when just traveling and they go, wow, we can get it less expensive. It's, it's true. But yeah. you know, I want to tell you something about price, because and, and maybe those of you who are watching, there's a perception that the French wine is expensive. Right. And in some sense, it is. So I have two things to say about that. First of all, when you go there. It's a very different price. You will be surprised how little the price is. It's not as expensive as you think. Okay. The second thing is, is that if we go back to 1855, when Napoleon was ahead of the, 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 the World's Fair in Paris, decided who were the best wineries in the world. These, these are the, the Grand Cru Class A's of 1855. Those Grand Cru's today, 150 years later, have this prestige. That's Chateau de Tour, Chateau Margaux, Chateau Lafitte, Chateau Mouton. They sell their wine for $1,000 a bottle, and not just there, but here, too. Right. So that gives this perception of very expensive. Right, because we only hear about that. Right, because they're so high profile. Yeah. But there are lots of wines that are $20, 25 30 $35 that are extraordinary wines. And there's even wines that compete with those Lafitte's, for example, that are maybe $100 to $200 a bottle <laughs> that... You know, when you compare that to a thousand, 
it's a very different story. It's not what we think that everything is expensive. And everything in my book, by the way, I have gone there, I have tasted the wine to make sure that these are really great wines. And I can tell you, I walk out of there sometimes when thinking to myself, that bottle is only $10. I think that is an amazing bottle of wine for $10. Can I tell you my $10 story? Uh-oh. <laughs> so you and I uh, both live in the area of Pasadena, right. but maybe I don't see you as often. I like champagne. I mm -hmm. like sparkling wine. And I consider myself, uh, and anybody that's on Facebook knows that I like champagne. And I'm, it's a, a tattinger I like. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just stick with that. I'm not going to rattle off any other names. So I'm at a defunct restaurant in Pasadena called Paul Martin. Mm -hmm. And they have it for $80 a bottle, whatever it is. And I'm sharing it with this young lady. And she says to me, it's during Christmas time. Mm -hmm. She says, do you like Tappinger? I said, I love it. She goes, you know, they have a, a champagne at Trader Joe's for $10 that you need to try. And I said, no, 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 honey. <laughs> no, no, that's sparkling wine. And she goes, well, whatever it is, check it out. And I thought, okay, for some reason, I, I went up to Trader Joe's and it was simply called, Michael, it was simply called Mendocino Sparkling Wine. That was the only name on it. At wow. Trader Joe's. That was it. That was it. Okay. Ten dollars a bottle. And it was phenomenal. Wow. And I was impressed. And there I was saying I would never spend less than twenty-five. <laughs> like like uh, a Schaffenberger would be about as low as I would go on the sparkling wine, mm -hmm. and maybe a Domaine Chandon and things like that. I was just like I learned, and I just had to check myself. And to Michael's point, to everybody watching out there, whatever you drink, whatever you like. It's fine because I actually bought two bottles because I was so enthralled and knew knew that anything at Trader Joe's might not last, especially at that price. I ended up bringing two bottles because I just thought, wow, this is the perfect holiday wine to bring to people's homes that say, hey, here's the champagne guy. What did you bring? And it ended up being really good. It ended up being really good. Wow. So yeah. I wonder if it's, I don't know, we got to, maybe I got to make a, a trip to Trader Joe's to see if it's still there, mm -hmm. but it was called Mendocino Sparkling Wine, and it was good for ten dollars. If it was thirty-five dollars, I don't know, but for ten dollars, it was darn good. Well, sparkling wine does not mean that it's not good. Remember, in the beginning, you were talking about uh, champagne. In order to put the name champagne on the bottle, it must have been from that specific region. So, for example, in Bordeaux. They make sparkling wine, but they cannot call it champagne. Where is the Reims uh, area of France? That's Is it below champagne? Mm -hmm. It's adjacent. It's mm -hmm. just below it. Exactly. Okay. So that is, is, so that's not a part of champagne. So on the bottle, it would say Reims. Yeah. And they're going to have to call it sparkling wine. Okay. It's just like the Schramsberg you say you love. I love it. It's, I and it's really good. Yeah. I love it too. Yeah. Napa Valley. It says sparkling wine because you have to, yeah. it's a trademark. Right. And then, you know, the people that are watching probably see when they go to the supermarket, they'll see something like Corbel and it will say uh, Champagnois, uh, meaning uh, the same style, like mm -hmm. Champagne style, but it's not really. So I well, want- Well, the Champagnois I, style is that secondary fermentation to create the sparkling naturally in the bottle. I brought this Norton Malbec for you, actually, especially because I had a bottle of rosé, Grenache rosé, uh, in the car, and I got no. Wait a minute, Michael Higgins. I better bring some Malbec. So this runs Norton runs about fourteen or fifteen dollars at the store. Um, are you familiar with the brand? I am. Okay, it's one of the largest wineries in Argentina. Okay, they're 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 huge. And cheers. So so the the notes. I love Malbec. I guess you knew that. That's why you brought this. Malbec yeah. is so good. So from Argentina. I'm going to throw out some terms, and I don't want to bore people, but I don't find this to be fruit forward like a California uh, Cabernet would be, not jammy at all. This is more of chalky, earthy, mm -hmm. and uh, it's more serious than more. it is fruity. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, I was right. Thank goodness I was right. <laughs> I got one right finally on the line. 
but that was just, it's just like that's pretty good. Yeah, it is good. Do you, do you have any suggestions? We should talk about this. Mm -hmm. Malbec, that, right? Well, no food and such. Oh, food, okay. What? Give me some foods that a Malbec might be considered. I mean, obviously in Argentina they're eating a lot of steak, but would this be something that you would get um, in steak? You know, the classic thing in Argentina yeah. is a bottle of Malbec right. and asado. Asado is the meat cooked over wood and they cook it for several hours. It is the most amazing thing you've ever tasted. And that really is the pairing. When you're asking about pairing, is that beef, incredible beef and incredible Malbec. Are they, I didn't read the book, are they into cheeses in Argentina like we are in France? Not nearly as much as we are, okay. and not not nearly as much as France. Is. So they would import their cheese. Yes. Okay. Well, and then they do have cheese there too. Okay. They do, but it's not. I mean, the big thing with the wine is the beef. How are we doing on time? You guys are kind of looking at something. We're okay. We're okay. All right. Maybe they we're need good. a little wine here. That's maybe what the problem is. Not problem, but maybe we need to. If we've got two ladies helping us with the whole thing, and they should be drinking. They with should us. be drinking, and we're the ones yes. having a good time. <laughs> You know. Well, cheers to the okay. ladies cheers having a glass of wine. Yes. Cheers to the book. Well, you know something? What started this book series for me is exactly this wine. It's Malbec. I love Malbec, and I wondered why the Argentines made it so good. We have a question. We do. Should we have boys California wines, and for how long because of the fires? Should we do what to them? Avoid, Avoid California them. Wines. Well, those bought, okay, I'm going to say my part, and my part will be 10 seconds. But those wines haven't even come to to store yet. So, no, to, we're still for especially red wines. We're still drinking 2017s and 2018s. So these wines aren't going to be available now. About the price, that might have an effect. Wow, what what what? This is an amazing question, and people have been asking me this question. And I thought to myself, okay, wine is aged in oak barrels, right? And they burn those oak barrels. They actually put fire in there and they, it's called toasting. Yeah. So toasting. the wine is living in this burnt oak. Right. And I thought, okay, well, if you have a fire, just have less burnt oak, right? Reduce it. Okay. But the <laughs> I mean, smoke it, that hits the, the, the leaves and the grapes. Well, but that's, that's my point. If it's on the grapes, I thought, Okay, well, you already got some of this toasted, smoky stuff. Right. Maybe if they just compensated at the other end, but it's not really true at all. Okay, it's okay. Not. Said, wow, maybe they can make lemonade out of lemons here and say, we're charging more because it's 2020, it's toasted. Well, some people say, hey, I like the toasty flavor in yeah. wine, and, mm -hmm. and, and it actually is good. Well, know? right, there's a, we're, we're talking about wine, but there's a very popular bourbon that actually, that they, they, uh, the casks are toasted mm -hmm. and they, they charge and they more are. for it. It is toasted and that's, it's important. But here's what happens. And actually those of you who are watching, since I, I heard you're, you've been having chemistry classes all week, this is really a chemistry discussion because that smoke, the, chem the chemicals in that smoke are what's destroying the grape. It's yes. not the flavor, yes. it's, the, yeah. it's the chemical. It's a, it's, a, it's a chemical reaction of the smoke and the grape, and it destroys it. And, and, and I'm not a chemist and I'm not a scientist, but I was reading about this, and I wish I could throw out some fancy chemical names, but that it's, 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 it's an actual destructive process that those grapes aren't any good, no I, matter what you do out I've got to let you in a little secret here, and I hope you take this well, and I hope you're flattered by what I'm going to tell you. The gentleman that was supposed to be the guest today is Hugh Davies, who is the winemaker for Schramsberg. Yeah. His dad. Uh, but on the phone with him two days ago, they're still, they still, at the winery, at the winery, they still have firemen there putting out fires. And wow. they said that, uh, I didn't know that Schramsberg even produced red wine. I thought it was all just um, champagne or sparkling wines. But he had told me that some of the white wines are going to be a little bit more difficult to get in the future. So, but that, I think that's a couple of years away. I mean, at least two, because we're only, we're correct, we're like a Rombauer Chardonnay is 2017, 2018. I know that for a fact. So, the white grapes are picked first. 
Okay. And I think all of the white grapes were picked before the fires. In fact, a lot of the red grapes were picked before the fires. So it all depends on when it was picked. Because once the fire hit, that's what changed the story. So especially the quality wineries, once the fire hit, they stopped. Yeah. They're not even gonna deal with it. They're just gonna let those grapes go and they're gonna make they're gonna make less wine is what they're gonna do. Right. Which might be uh, bring up the prices. But speaking of Hugh Davies and Schromsberg, you know, he's doing Chardonnay. That should have been harvested. He should be okay. okay. But I have something funny to say that, that's really interesting about Hugh, because I know Hugh. Okay. And he so and, and we can we could tie this back to Bordeaux and Napoleon. So Napoleon used to celebrate his battles by using a sword and taking open the bottle. You ever seen that happen where they take the sword and they open the bottle with the sword? Right. Hugh taught me how to do that. It's actually called sabering. Sabering. Exactly. So he taught me how to saber champagne or sparkling wine. This is how much Napoleon loved champagne. Yeah, that's true. He right. would say, uh, in victory, I deserve it. And in defeat, I need it. Maybe not those exact words. Well, that's, that's right. That's what you said. <laughs> Maybe that, I think that's probably my, my, uh -huh. my life mantra, too. Right. With, with, in depression, I need it. And in victory, I love it. <laughs> well, you know, when we go home at night and we open up a bottle of wine? Yeah. Well, we had a good day and we're celebrating. We had a bad day and you're right. We needed it. Right. right. <laughs> okay. Let's talk more about the book. I think okay. that it's, the opportunity is to swing back. Okay. Let's talk about the book. Yeah. Um, anytime that I'm on my radio show, Go Country 105, every Sunday morning, you yeah. can go onto my website, diningwithdills.com, in case you're out of the area, which a lot of people are. Um, the idea is when I interview a restaurateur or a restaurant or a chef, they, at the end of the uh, interview, not saying we're done, they say, well, this is where we're at. This is how you get to our restaurant. Mm -hmm. We haven't even talked about how do we get to the book? How do we get to the book? How do we get the book? <laughs> yes. I mean, you can drive down to St. Gabriel right now and that's maybe, right. <laughs> meet us in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> so you can go to our website, exploringwineregions.com. There's a tab that says books and you can get our books. Um, this month is, of course, the introduction of this book. October 15th is the official release. And so if you go to one of our social media sites, meaning Facebook or Instagram, and you like our post, you make a comment and you ask for a discount, we're gonna give you a discount code for $10 off. Okay, great. And then you can go to our website and get it for $10 off. And- Do, Dare I say, dare I ask about Amazon? Yep, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it on Barnes and Noble, there are a lot of places, lots of books, Romans, 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 Romans has it, independent bookstores, big stores. We have, we, we're distributed by Baker and Taylor. They're the largest book distributor in the world. Okay. So they do an amazing job with, with this book. In fact, they've already gone through the first palette of books and it's not even released yet. I mean, so it's, 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 it's on its way. It is something unique and the, um, I kind of, uh, I like the uh, airplane thing, but yeah. what about a, a boat? Like all these rich folks that have boats, you know, like uh, the Caruso, the Caruso has a, a, a gigantic boat there off of Newport. Maybe maybe we spend time on a boat and talk about what they're drinking on boats. I don't yes. know. <laughs> the boat cruise. The boat cruise, yes. Yeah. Well, you know what? This makes a great gift. I don't know if you can tell from there. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's got this, this, this vellum plastic with gloss on the photos. It's got these French gate folds here. The book is printed on museum quality art paper. Absolutely. It is absolutely stunning. It's only 45 bucks and you can get it for 35 bucks with that discount. And we got written up in um, um, Departures Magazine. You know, Departures is the magazine for American Express, the, you know, the black card and so forth. And they said that this is the perfect gift for any wine lover. Okay, so you this book releases this week, and then we're gonna- In eight days. In eight days, we're gonna move on to exploring wine regions of California. California. What after that? What, what can we imagine after that? Well, picture this. Argentina was big. It's 350 pages. This one is 494 pages. California will be another 350 pages at least. 
What I want to do after California is something small and simple. I want to go to New Zealand. Uh, okay. And since we were talking the, about Pinot Noirs, the, the Pinot Noirs and the Sauvignon Blancs there are just extraordinary. We'll make a smaller book. Okay. That's what I plan to do. All right. So we've been pretty positive here. I yep. mean, we have, we have just given sunshine to, to the wine industry. Are there some places that are producing wine that just shouldn't? I've got one, but are there places that shouldn't be producing wine that, eh, that you're not too big on? Any, any, any countries that say, hey, if you're going for wine tasting, that maybe that's not where you want to go. All right. What I've learned yes. is it's all about the terroir. It really the, is. The terrain, and, and, it, and, is. And if you think of Bordeaux, and, if, and my, my book is an education, by the way, on terroir. France is an education on terroir. But it holds true even here in California. So when you ask this question, it's all about the terroir. If you've got the right environment for that particular grape, okay. that's where the magic happens. Right. And you just can't do that everywhere. Right. You know, you, it's it, ha it has to have certain kinds of of ingredients, let's call it. There's quite a few ingredients, but but that's important. It's so essential. I was born. I was born in Athens, Greece. Okay. Does that mean ten seconds or ten minutes? No, ten minutes. We got ten minutes. I was born in Athens, Greece. Okay. And I went back a few years ago and tried the wine. Went to this beautiful winery, beautiful winery. And then on the island that we were on, I can't remember. They actually it's, they're growing it. The 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 grapevines look more like bushes. They, they do like vines because it's a volcanic, the water's actually, they're not relying on the rain, they're relying on the water seeping up through the volcanic mm -hmm. ashes to feed the bushes. I'm not mm -hmm. even going to call them vines, but I didn't think the wine was that great. And I know that Mexico was producing wine for years, a lot of wine for years, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's just sometimes when I go to different places like they, they haven't figured it out, but I don't know. Well, just like with every product, there's the good and the bad. See, you've right? got a positive spin on everything. <laughs> yes, we have another question. We have a question. Is it okay to mix red and white? Well, what does that mean? I mean, like, I'm, I am, <laughs> where I'm mixing it. You mean, I wonder if the question is for us to mix the red and white or for the winemaker to mix the red and white? For the drinker. So the drinker. should I be having a, a cracker between the red and white? Is that what the question is? Or are they saying, I'm going to... If you want to drink a red and a white, I would start off with food that paired really nicely with the white, and then I would move on to the red. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this. <laughs> okay. I, well, I, would, I, would, I would do what we're doing. You see, we have got the white and we have the red. I really like this uh, cake break. Right. It's, it's really good, isn't it? Is, it? It's really yes. good. Yeah, and, and Cake Fred's a great winery. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know the story. Why don't you tell the story of Cake Fred? Kind of like what you're doing, your book. The, the gentleman that started Cake Fred was taking photographs mm -hmm. and bought a plot of land up in Napa Valley. Isn't it amazing how it starts? Yeah. You never Just, know. It, it, so, you're familiar with the story? I'm not familiar with so that story. So, he's now. a photographer and a young guy, and and is going to a winery and loves the winery. And the, the guy that owns the winery commissions him to take photos and says, hey, I really like what you do. I want to do this. And he goes, well, you know, this is in the 70s. You know, across the street, you can get 12 acres for back then, whatever it was. Did this, planted this. And they said, the rest, seriously, as that's, how it happened. that's how Cape Red wow. started. As a, wow. as a person that just enjoyed taking uh -huh. pictures of grapes and wines. Like you, maybe there's a, a, a winery in your future. You know, every time I go to a wine <laughs> region, I think, oh, man, wouldn't that be fun to yeah. do? I mean, yes, it would be a lot of work, but what a great business to be in, right? Well, come on, Ray, and we need help. What was the movie with Kevin Klein when he went over to France and, and grabbed the, uh, the vine to, to, to smuggle back over here to the States because he was going to start his own winery? Uh, okay. It was Kevin Klein? Kevin Klein. Oh, know. definitely Kevin Klein. Klein. I don't know. And he went to France and he, he bought this. His whole thing was he was going to buy this vine and yeah. smuggle it, smuggle it uh -huh. back into the to the States. It was like gold or something. And uh, A lot of that goes on, yeah. by the way, smuggling vines. Yeah. Yes. And uh, that was his whole thing. 
And I think it. I think it, at the end of the, the movie, it turned out all right. French Kiss. <laughs> what? French Kiss French. is the name of the movie. French Kiss. French Kiss. Okay, with was it Melanie Griffith? I I don't know. French Kiss. So yeah, you smuggled over. You wanted smuggled, in. smuggled the mine back over here. Yeah. Meg Ryan. Huh? Meg Ryan. Oh <laughs> man, see that's Thank I'm you, glad Joy. somebody knew that. I, You're yeah, welcome. So, well, I, like well, to I watch googled the movie. it. I don't remember all the pieces. Isn't the zoo thing great? I mean, we, we we can if we forget if we have a brain fart and somebody's out there to answer the questions yes. for us. Well, I was hoping they just turn it off and then we could recover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I walked out. You know, I wouldn't have gotten French Kiss. I I, I, I was thinking when I don't know. Harry yes. Salmon or something crazy like that. Well, all right, we talk. Peter, to be honest That's, with you. Um, I think we got, we could have you guys on every night. Um, that'd be fine by me. Because, okay, uh, we, could, oh, we could just keep going. That's this. a signal. <laughs> yes. I, I do want to get a, uh, give a, a shout out to your location, Clearman's yes. uh, Northwoods Inn. Yeah, in San Northwoods Gabriel. Inn. And um, they, sure they're, right. the Clearman's family does uh, own uh, also Stakenstein. And uh, so if any of you live anywhere near a Clearman's, uh, feel free to drop in and uh, they're dining outdoors at the moment. But I, I suspect that uh, Governor uh, Grusham will let them go indoors here pretty soon. Anyway, um, and they were kind enough to let us uh, video there today. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you, Michael, for being a participant. Oh, yes. And buy, buy the book. Please buy, buy the book. Thank you. You will love it. Thank you to the Pacific Water Quality Association for Thank you for having us talk today. Yeah, yes. much better, yes. This was fun. <laughs> so go out and buy Michael's book and listen to my radio show on Sundays. It, go Country. We'll go you know what? Big uh, thanks to both of you. I really, really appreciate it. And I know PWQA does too. And so cheers to both of you and everybody online. And we will see uh, our association members tomorrow morning at the bright early hour of seven o'clock. Cheers to you. Cheers. Night night, everybody. Cheers Thank to you, everybody. Michael and Peter. Cheers. Gosh, it's great to see all your faces. Now I see who we've been talking to. <laughs> Cheers to all of you. Why did you? <laughs> I hope you're opening a great bottle of wine tonight and uh <laughs> Thank you for letting us talk. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Well, we of have course. cheers from South they, Korea. Ooh. From South Korea. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yes, we have uh, members from all over. Well, for, for, for whoever that is in South Korea, I am here. This is printed in South Korea. Oh. How is that? <laughs> okay. They do an incredible job for us, as you can see. Perfect. So cheers to South Korea. Thank you, Konbe, Korean Konbe. <laughs> yes. I think that's wrong. Konbe is Japanese. <laughs> yes. Bye, well, everyone. Cool. We'll see you in the morning. That was fun. Thank you, guys. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.